And uh, we'll just do a quick summary of last week. I don't know if, if you were here last week to hear Pastor Rob share a message on the breakthrough and the breaker. It really was a powerful message. So if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, I would encourage you to go on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook, to look it up and just um, really I mean, take notes. It was just such a blessed message. And um, Pastor Rob is a good friend of Pastor Steve's. He's a pastor at a church in Connecticut. And this was a message that he had put on, God had put on his heart about the breaker, someone who comes in, Jesus comes in to break through our circumstances. When things don't look like there is hope, that God is there to come in and shake things up and to move forward. You know, a lot of times we feel frustrated because we feel stuck. But Jesus wants to ensure and assure us today that we're never stuck when we have Jesus. He's always able to break through. Amen? So we're going to look at uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 14. And we're going to look at, I know it's, everybody's like, where's Chronicles? Right? We're so used to reading the New Testament. Sometimes we don't look in the Old Testament. But as Pastor Steve always sh shares with us about the story Everything in the Old Testament is foreshadowing of Jesus. Amen? So it's a good idea to get on one of those Bible that you can make sure that you read, you know, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Amen? So we're going to look at 1 Chronicles 14, uh, verse 8. But before we start, I just wanted to, I feel like, uh, you know, sharing a little joke. Nate had a presentation this week um, for space. It was his big second grade presentation. And him being the funny kid he is, he's like, you think I should open up with a joke? So I think that's a good idea. So I want to tell a quick funny story about Nate. So he gave me a beautiful Mother's Day uh, card and present. It was just so beautiful. And he told me like I was the cherry on top of his Sunday. And I was the best Christmas present he could have. But his last line was that I was the end of his world. I think he meant that I was like, you know, the best of his world, but he said the end of his world. <laughs> so this, this one I'm going to have to save. This one I'm going to have to save. But, but kids really, I mean, anybody who's a mom today, I just want to wish everybody happy Mother's Day. Um, because kids really make the world brighter, right? Every year my kids, since they've been very little, have helped me with all of my women's retreat preparations. And it's a big thing in our house because we have gifts, we have uh, presents, we have notes, we have photocopies. So like for two weeks, everything in our house is all about women's retreat. And it looks exciting, especially to a little kid because you have bows and colors and candy and presents. It's like Christmas, except it's for the women's retreat. So every year, my kids always want to help, you know, stuff the bags. And that's always a little stressful to me because you know, I only have a certain amount of everything, but every year I just say, okay, well, everything was going fine until we invited Nate into the process. And so one year I had him help, and people said, hey, I didn't get a candy. I didn't get gum. I didn't get this. And I, and I was thinking, oh, maybe we, we made a mistake. And then Felice said, Nate, next year it's just notebooks for you. It's just notebooks. Because we were missing the chocolate. We missed the gum. Something happened, you know? So I, I figured out real quickly that that was too much of a temptation for him, you know? So he can't handle the candy and the gum in the women's retreat bags. He only has to do the notebooks. That's it from now on. So they're just such a blessing, and they really just add so much love to our hearts, right? They make our hearts so much bigger, amen? And I'm sorry to you ladies who missed your chocolate or your gum. <laughs> so we're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 8. And we're going to look at this particular uh, account in the Bible of David. At this point in David's life, he had already defeated Goliath, right? And many years had passed at this point in his journey, right? We know that David was... Uh, was basically anointed king very young, but he wasn't able to take his position for a while. So First Chronicles chapter 14, verse 8, it says, Now when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, 
all the Philistines went up to search for David. Now, if you remember, the Philistines are the group of people that Goliath was the champion of. So this is a group of people who are still after him, are still after the Hebrew people, are still after the Jewish people. It says, And David heard of it and went out against them. Then the Philistines went and made a raid on the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, Go up, for I will deliver them into your hand. So they went up to Baal Perizim, and David defeated them there. Then David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. Therefore they called the name of that place Baal Perizim, and when they had left their gods there, David gave a commandment, and they were burned with fire. So I just wanted to, us to look at this real quickly, because God is showing us something very powerful through this, this little piece of scripture, is that David had to ask God. He asked him. A lot of times what happens is when we're going through a situation or a circumstance, our first reaction is not necessarily to ask God. Our first reaction is to complain, right? Or to call somebody and say, hey, did, did you hear what happened? Or I have to tell you what, this, you know, what happened at work or what this person said to me or what notice I got in the mail. Our first reaction is not always to ask God, right? But David did, and David asked him, am I able to basically overcome? And he waited for the Lord's answer. But remember, David had had a lot of training, right? David, we know, was a shepherd. And, and he had a very special, intimate relationship with God. He would spend hours and hours in the fields worshiping, right? Getting to know God, singing his praises. I mean, we can look at the Psalms, and you can see all the different things that God had delivered David from. I mean, there's so many situations that David found himself in, that God came through, and he gave them these different revelations. So in this particular situation that David was going through, God reveals to him a new, basically, part of his character. Now he's the God of breakthrough. He's the God who comes through like water. You know, when, when uh, people have a natural disaster, you know, people can say, I can handle wind, I can handle, you know, this, I can handle that. But the one thing that's very hard to handle is a flood. Because when a flood comes, it a actually wipes out everything. Like a tsunami comes, there's, there's no survivors. It just completely overtakes them. But in this particular case, when we see what David, when he talks to God and he, he calls God the God of breakthrough, he says he will break through like water. So that means that in this particular case, that God is the one who is overtaking the enemy, so much like a flood, coming in and overtaking the Philistines. And so David said that this place is going to be dedicated to what God did, that he was able to break through, that he was able to come in and help, and help me to overcome. You know, we know that we have things in our life that we struggle with, right? I mean, Jesus tells us ahead of time, in this world, you will have trouble. That, that's one of those scriptures that we just kind of want to go, I, I don't really want that part, right? I want all the promises in him or yes and amen. I, I don't want to know that I'm going to have trouble, but yet it's going to come. Jesus tells us ahead of time that it's going to come. In fact, what happens is the devil, the Bible tells us, is more crafty than any beast of the field, which means he sets a trap for us. He sets up a trap, and he is just waiting, right, to come and to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Okay, that's what the Bible tells us. So it should be no surprise when trouble comes because Jesus already tells us that's what the devil does. In fact, he doesn't just say that he comes to steal. He doesn't come and just say that he comes to kill. He 
actually says that he comes to destroy. That means to utterly obliterate it. That's what he's trying to do to us, right? But what does Jesus say? But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. So that means that even though that's the devil's mode of operation, Jesus gives us the power to be above it. He gives us the power to break through. He gives us the power to come in and to say, this isn't going to happen. That Jesus is going to be able to give us the power to get through it, to overcome, to be on the other side of victory, just like David was in this particular story with the Philistines. But you know, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's hard. I was just reading a story of Jim Thorpe. I don't know how many people have heard of him, but he was an athlete that lived in the early 1900s. And he was a very good athlete, and he participated in like eight of the games in the 1912 Olympics. But he was so good that somebody stole his shoes the morning of the race. Now, most people would have been like, I guess I can't race. I guess that's it. I guess I'm going to lose. I'm going to have to forfeit. But do you know what he did? He found two shoes in the garbage that were not his, that didn't match and were the wrong size. And he put those shoes on, and he said, I am determined to run my best race. And I am not going to let this circumstance get in the way of me winning. And there are actually pictures from the 1912 Olympics, you can Google it, Jim Thorpe, where you see his shoes, and they are different. Because he said, I am going to overcome. I'm going to be the type of person that's not going to let this circumstance get in the way of all of the training that I've put in, of all of the dedication that I've put in, of all of my hard work, of all of my sweat, of all of my effort. I'm not going to let somebody come and steal it. I'm not going to come and let somebody destroy it, my opportunity to win. And you know what? He went on to win eight of those games, and he won a ton of gold medals. But he had to have that, that really like that gusto to go and to win and to try. A lot of times what happens is we've had situations in our life that have beat us up so bad that we don't want to try anymore. So the devil already has us defeated before we even start. When we were meeting with Jay last week talking about this mission, he said that's the biggest trouble that he has with this village is that they're already defeated. They already see themselves as poor. They already see themselves with no education, no hope for change. Why even bother? So that's why God put it in on his heart to reach the children, because they don't have what the parents have yet. They still think a little bit, maybe, maybe I can break through and get out of this. Maybe I will be the one to go to school. Maybe I will be the one to get a good job. Maybe I will be the one to be able to provide for my family. Maybe I'll be the one. The kids are the ones that have hope that something is going to happen, that something is going to change, that God's going to do something in their lives. So he's ministering the truth of the gospel to them, that Jesus says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But you have to have that expectation that God is going to do it. Without that expectation, hope cannot build. See, Jim Thorpe knew and had an expectation. I've trained. I've worked. I will win. I just need some shoes. Right? But how do we get that expectation? How do we get to the point where we can be able to trust God and know that he is who he says he is and that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119 that his word is settled in heaven. Settled, settled, settled. That's it. Settled. Right? His word is settled in heaven. That means that there are no questions anymore about what his intentions are, what his expectations are for us. If he said it, he means it. But what happens when the circumstances 
don't match up to that expectation. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Contending, fighting, believing, praying until you have an answer for your breakthrough. Because we know Jesus is able, amen? We know God the Father is able, right? We know the Holy Spirit actually gives us wisdom and mysteries to help us to be able, right? But are we able? Some of the responsibility comes on us that we are the ones who need to contend. We are the ones that need to fight. We are the ones who have to believe. Amen? Amen. So there's a story about a Christian uh, woman. Her name's Karen Wheaton. I don't know if anybody has ever listened to her, but she shares a story about how she grew up in a Christian family. She served God her whole life. Her children served God. Her husband served God. Her children married men who served God. Her whole family was in the ministry. And her daughter, her youngest daughter, all of a sudden, it seemed out of nowhere, divorced her husband, walked away from the church, and completely changed. And she was devastated. She said, God, I don't understand. How could this happen? And he, she said that her daughter turned into a person she didn't even know. She walked away from her two daughters, her husband, her church, her family. And she just left. And, and this was, as any mother would be upset when your, your child makes bad decisions, her, her, Karen was devastated. She was like, I, you know, I don't know what to do. And people were telling her, well, there's nothing you can do, Karen. Your child's an adult. She makes her own decisions. It's a shame. But that's all you can do. You can't let it ruin your life. You just have to accept it. She said, do I? Do I have to accept something that I know is not God's will for my life? Do I have to accept a child who I prayed for, who I spoke words of encouragement over, who I prayed promises over, who, who was married and have children? Because we know when we, when we walk away from the Lord or we do something that's not pleasing to him, sometimes we think it's just our own sin that's affecting us. It affects generations. It affects families. It affects us, you know, exponentially in our lives. And this was a decision that her daughter was making that was going to hurt her family for generations. And Karen said, I, I don't accept that. I can't accept that God's going to just let this go. Right? I mean, the daughter's her own person. She makes her own choices. But she knew she had to do something. She had to stand in the gap for her daughter. She had to pray her daughter back to the Lord. She had to pray. That, now, granted, the daughter makes her own decisions. But our prayers impact our lives. Okay? Because we know what God wants for us. Right? He wants blessings. He wants peace. He wants joy. He wants obedience. So she began to pray and seek God. And she said the prayer that she held on to was a prayer that Jehoshaphat prays. Again, we're going back to the Old Testament people. So I think God wants us to do something here. But um, this was uh, a prayer from Second Chronicles chapter 20. And this is Jehoshaphat's prayer. I'm just going to read it quickly. It says, hold on one second. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You know, the Bible tells us that Jehoshaphat had armies on every side. He was facing three different armies. And Jeho Jehoshaphat was a king. He was a king of Judah. This was when Israel and Judah were di the divided kingdom of Israel. And he was the king that was tearing down the high places. And back in the Old Testament, what happened was, it sounds similar today, is that people would, instead of worshiping God Almighty, the God of the Hebrews, right, the God of Israel, Isaac, Jace, Jacob, Abraham, they were worshiping all these false gods. And so what they would do is, in the Old Testament, they would have shrines 
dedicated to all of these false gods. And they called them the high places. So Jehoshaphat would come in there and he started tearing them down. He started to return back to what God wanted. But so here he is with his army, right? And he has three opposing armies facing him on all sides. And the Bible tells us at first he panics. Who wouldn't, right? (laughs) We see opposition on every single side. But then he calls a fast. And what happens when we fast is that we get in a position to humble ourselves because we're denying ourselves of the very basic need we have of food. And when we fast, again, it doesn't change God, but it changes our ability to be more centered and able to listen very closely to his will. So he calls a fast, and then he prays this very powerful prayer where he says that we don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. How many times has that happened where you don't know what to do? You're faced with such an amazing situation. It's so overwhelming. You don't know what to do. Oh, God, I don't know what to do. I'm so stuck. I feel stuck. But my eyes are on you. My heart is on you, God. My mind is on you. My eyes are on you. Because you're the one who's going to break through this circumstance. You're the one who's going to come in. And you're the one who's going to take over like a flood. You're going to take over the enemy like a flood. You're the one who's going to help me break through. And we know what happens in the story is that they overcame. Because they listened to God. So Karen Wheaton shares that she, this was her verse that she held for two years as she began to pray for her daughter to return back to the Lord. And she said that she would get very quiet and she would listen, and God gave her 40 different promises for her daughter and her family. And she said she would cry, and she would pray, and she would fast, and she would cry, and she would pray. Because how, do we, how, how many of us know that when we're going through a situation, a five-minute devotional with coffee is not going to cut it? It's just not. You know, the Bible says, ask, seek, knock. I always think of it, you know, when someone comes to the door, and they go, excuse me, is anybody home? Right? But if they really want to talk to you, what do they do? Go over to your window, start peeking in. Is anybody there? And if they really want to talk to you, they get up to your door. Right? Open the door. Open the door. Well, that's the kind of heart we have to have when we're facing a situation, when we're contending for that breakthrough. We can't pray one of those, excuse me, God, um, I was really hoping that you could help bless me in this situation. That's just not going to work, right? It's not going to work if we're just peeking in the windows. God, are you in there somewhere? Are you hearing me? I I need to know, God, if you can help me here. No, it has to be, Lord, Lord, God, you hear me, right? I know what your word says. I know you're going to answer me. God, please, Lord, you said in your word. You said it, Lord. You said it, God. You said it. That's the kind of heart we have to have for contending, for believing, for fighting. We can't have one of those, please. It has to be, yes, Lord, and amen. I know what your word says. I'm expecting you to do something here. So what Karen said that eventually, after those two years, her daughter came back to the Lord. Her daughter got back with her husband, became again the mother of her children completely got restored into her family, into her ministry. But what if her mother just accepted it? What if her mother said, yeah, I guess you're right. It's not my problem. She makes her own choices now. That's why I thank God for mothers, right? Thank God for praying mothers. There's another story of this uh, man. His name's Mark Merrow. He's actually a former uh, wrestler. I know there's some people in our audience that like wrestling. (laughs) And this man um, 
grew up, he was an athlete. He was a football player, but he got involved with the wrong group of friends. How many times has that happened in high school? And his wrong group of friends had him drinking and doing drugs and doing everything that was bad. And he said that his mother, she was a single mom, she worked two jobs, and she would come to every single one of his games. And she just adored her son. And she was the kind of mom that you would see running down the football lane. Come on, Mark, make sure you do it. Can you catch that ball. Can you run faster? And everybody would say, is that your mother on the line? Is she following you? And he would say, Ma, go sit down. Leave me alone. Why are you watching me? I'm, I'm trying to play football here. Can you leave me alone? And she was just always loved him so much she had to be right where he was. But then he got involved with this wrong group of friends. And he said that he was out till all hours of the morning. And his mother would leave the light on in the house because she couldn't go to bed unless she knew he was home safe. So he, his friends would drop him off and then go, Mark, your light's on. That means your mother's up. And he was like, oh, what am I going to do now? So he'd walk in. He'd be drunk and high and everything else. And he would try to go up to his room. And he, she would say, Mark, I haven't seen you all day and all night. I love you, and I just want to talk to you. And he'd go, shut up, Mom, I'm going to bed. And the next day would happen, and she would say, Mark, I, I just want to sit with you. Can we have breakfast? Can I talk to you? Nope, I'm not, I'm not talking to you. I have to go out with my friends. Goodbye. And this happened for years and years and years. And what happened was he became this professional wrestler. He had everything. He had a beautiful wife. He was making millions of dollars. He had a, a you know, big job in the World Wrestling Federation. And he was very, very successful, but he had no peace. He had no peace. And what happened was he was actually doing a tour in Japan, and somebody knocked on his door in the middle of the night, and they said, there's been an emergency. Your mother died. And he said he was just devastated. He couldn't even contain what he felt. Because he never got to tell her that he loved her the way she loved him. So he left everything. And now he runs um, an organization where he visits high schools and he tells kids he's completely clean. He's not a drug addict anymore. And he tells kids that they, they need to love. They need to, to not fall into the trap of bad friends, of bad circumstances, of bad choices. And they need to honor their parents and love their parents. Because how many of you know that your parents are your greatest champions? They're the ones who fight for you. They're the ones who pray for you. They're the ones who love you and provide for you. Now, I know not everybody has a great mom or a great dad, but if you don't have a physical great mom or dad, you know you have a great heavenly father, amen? One who always is there. But he said he realized for the rest of his life that he was going to tell people that he loves his mother because he never got to tell her while she was still here. So we have to remember that our choices impact what we do. And we have to have that heart that wants to break through. You know, there's another story in the Bible of a mother who brings her daughter, and her daughter is demon-possessed. And the mother brings his daughter before Jesus, and she wants her daughter healed. And Jesus tells her something he doesn't usually say. He says, I wasn't come to saving you. I was come to save the people who were in Israel, not you. And he thought she would leave, but she didn't. She said, but, but even people come, and they eat the crumbs from the master's table. I'm not going to leave till my daughter is blessed and free. And Jesus was so impressed with this woman in her faith that he healed her daughter because the mother came and interceded for her, her daughter. I'm not leaving till I get my, my blessing. Just like we read or we heard last week about Jacob when he wrestled with God that he was not leaving till he got his blessing. Karen Wheaton was not leaving until her daughter came back. We have to have that heart that says no matter what, I am holding on, and I am not going to move. 
that I'm going to hold your word, Lord, because I know that you're not a man that you should lie. You're not a man that you should lie. And if you say it, you mean it, and you're going to come through. That's why that scripture is so important, because um, Bel Perizim means way maker. <laughs> it's us. Jesus makes a way. God makes a way when there is no way. So if there's no way, he makes a way. And what does Jesus tell us? He is the way. The way. There is no other. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So when you see a circumstance that's coming against you, coming against your family, coming against your children, coming against your circumstance, you say, no, Jesus, you tell me that you're the truth. So all these circumstances, they don't matter. I am not going to pay attention to them. All the promises are yes and amen in you because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Just you, Jesus, that's it. I'm not paying attention to any other circumstance. I'm not looking at anything else but you and your word. But we have to have that expectation. Without that expectation, without understanding the character and the love of God and the truth of his word, we falter. We start looking at wind and waves. We start looking at circumstances. We start looking at situations. And before we know it, now the targeted attack against us has already begun to steal we're on our way to be being killed. We're on our way to being destroyed because the Bible tells us that the enemy comes in and sets up a trap. You know, I always think of, and don't laugh, but in our family, Karate Kid's one of our favorite movies. Can you guess why? <laughs> Can you guess why? But anyway, for all, you know, if you haven't seen the Karate Kid, for some of you new people, it's 1984. It's a great movie to watch but in the movie they have the cobra kai's and like that's the bad that's the bad group of karate people they were all black you know and they they're just they don't practice the art the way that it should be it's all about having no mercy right and daniel who's the karate kid comes in and you don't think he has a chance to win right and he comes in and because of the skill that he got from his, okay, <laughs> yeah, sit down now. <laughs> Can you tell whose favorite movie it is? He comes in and he winds up beating them. But the reason why I always think of that is because their motto is no mercy. And that's what the enemy does to us. There's no mercy. There, there's no mercy. When his attack comes, there's no mercy. He wants to completely destroy you. He wants to completely destroy you, but God comes in. But God comes in. And he comes in and enables you to break through. He comes in and enables you to overcome your circumstance. He enables you to overcome and take the victory of what he's already promised. I want us to look um, real quickly at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And this is the story of when Lazarus is already dead in the tomb. And I want us to look at this because a lot of times people say to me, when they ask me for prayer, they say, but you don't know how bad it is. You don't know how, how bad it's gotten. Look, I don't see how God could fix this. And I always say to them, but Lazarus was dead. Four whole days. So let's Let's look at what God says here. It says, John chapter 11, verse 7, it says, So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Four days. It wasn't like he just died. Four whole days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. And Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, 
I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And I love this because Martha is very sad, right, that her brother died. And she kind of says, Jesus, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. But she still has hope. She says, but even now, but even now, but even now, if you ask God, he'll give you whatever you ask. But even now. So even when it looks like there is no hope, that the door has been closed, that your situation is over, that that circumstance is beyond your control, that you have armies on every side like Jehoshaphat, but even now God can do something. But even now he can knock that door down. But even now he will enable you to break through. You just have to hold his word. You just have to hold the truth. You just have to hold the way. You just have to hold him. You know, a lot of people ask me, but how do you do this, God? I, I don't understand. Like, how do you overcome? How do you in, get the faith to believe? How do you do that? It seems so hard. But it's not. Because God has already given us his will and his word. It's right here. We just have to read it and understand what he's telling us. But a lot of times what happens is when the circumstances keep coming and the armies are on every side, it's hard for us to listen and hear what he's saying. Well, I would encourage you in your quiet time, that's why it's called quiet time, to listen. Not as much talk. And ask God for a strategy. Ask God for a strategy like David. Am I able? What did Jehoshaphat say? God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. That means I'm going to listen to what you're going to tell me, and then I'm going to do it. So that's the first step is we need to listen to what God is telling us. We need to read. We need to understand what God tells us. The second thing we need to do is hold. This is where it gets hard. We need to hold on to that word. We need to pick those shoes up out of the garbage. We need to fight like we've never fought before. We need to keep going and not looking to the left or to the right. We need to hold that word and speak that word over our situation every single day. Every single day. It's funny, kids are very persistent. Right, so if I, um, you know, tell one of my kids and poor Nate, I'm going to pick on him again because he's very persistent. But if I tell him, you know, on Saturday we're going to get ice cream, he asks me every single day until Saturday comes if we're getting the ice cream. So Monday comes, we're going to get ice cream on Saturday, and he doesn't just ask one time, <laughs> right? He has three or four or five times. Wednesday comes. We are getting ice cream on Saturday, right? Thursday when he comes home from school, we're getting ice cream Saturday, right? We're getting it, right? Until Saturday comes and he says, when are we getting the ice cream? And he asks me every single time until it opens. And you know what? He gets up sometimes at 5.30 in the morning. So 5.30 in the morning, I'm getting asked, are we getting ice cream? until the kid gets ice cream. But he's persistent because his mother told him something, a promise, a promise that I was going to give him a blessing and he's contending for it and reminding me of my word. And that's what we need to do with the Lord. The Bible says put him in remembrance of his word. Put him in remembrance. Lord, but you said. But you promised. But you said. Uh, Kathy Ratty, who uh, was uh, the person who organized the healing conference, Healing for Everyone, two weeks ago, she shares a story about her daughter who had a very uh, serious physical problem. And they went to you know a few doctors, and they went to a doctor, and they gave her a bad report. And she says to God, this was not what you promised, Lord. 
This is not what you promised. So she continued to hold the word of the Lord. And when they went to the specialist, the specialist looked at the results and said, there's not a problem. Everything is okay. But she continued and said, God, that is not mine. I'm not receiving that for my daughter. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold your word. I'm going to hold you at your word because your word is settled in heaven. Amen? Amen. And the last thing that we have to do no matter what is we cannot give up. We cannot surrender. You know, if you look, you know, at, at people, and that's why Jesus tells us that the flesh is weak, right? The flesh wants to give in. It seems so much easier to just say, that's it, I've had enough. I, I can't fight anymore. But that's not the heart that God has given us. He's given us, right, the heart and the spirit of a warrior, right? We know from the New Testament, it's, that's what they call us, warriors, right? That we don't get in, entangled, right, in the affairs of this life, that, but we would be a soldier for Jesus, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, God tells us we need armor. That means we must be in some kind of a battle. We better be ready. We better be ready to fight. We better be ready to win and not give up. See, if you have that revelation that God is going to come through, you're not going to give up because you know that he's the God of breakthrough. Remember, David set up that memorial because he wanted to remember what God did. Right? Remember. Ask God to remind you of the victories you've already had of the prayers that he's already answered, of the victories that you've had in your life in your, with your family, with your children. Ask him to remind you what he's done. Because when we forget, that's when the enemy can come in and continue to steal. That's what happened with the Israelites. They forgot that Moses was able to part the Red Sea. They forgot that God delivered them from those ten plagues. They forgot what God did. So they were able to get back into captivity in a wandering in the desert desert for 40 years. And not one of them, except for two, were able to get into the promised land because they didn't believe. So we need to believe God this morning. We need to hold on to his word. We need to listen to what he's telling us. And we need to not give up no matter what. That's how we contend for that breakthrough. That's how we're able to overcome. That's how we're able to have victory in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Thank you.